Thank you for joining us for the November edition of Three Squares, our Thanksgiving version. Thankful to you for listening. We certainly appreciate that. And thanks to Kevin and Susan for the friendship we've established since the pandemic when we began this adventure uh, without any any intention of having a podcast, but here it is. Uh, my name is Charlie Arnott. I am with Look East and the Center for Food Integrity, and our mission is to help the food system remain trustworthy and build trust from uh, from brands to consumers. And I'll turn it over to my co-hosts, Kevin and Susan. Susan Schwally. Well, what I do has been changing a lot lately, but I have about 28 years uh, working with food and beverage companies and uh, leveraging data to help them change their business and grow. Right now, I'm actually helping um, a tech startup company in the research space set up a new consumption panel. Um, so that's been that's been a lot of fun. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice that that Susan has a new interior designer. So it's really <laughs> it's very impressive, very impressive. So uh, Kevin Ryan, Malachi Strategy and Research, uh, helping. Uh, consumer packaged good companies, retailers, and ingredient companies at the front end of strategy and innovation. So it is It is November, which is a, a month of Thanksgiving, and there's so much to be thankful for. Many of us either will or have already celebrated a delightful meal with family and friends and uh, have heavy leftovers as we've taken a nap and watched some football. Uh, so it's a great time for us to express appreciation, uh, not just for what we have, but for those who don't have as much and for those who help provide. And today we've got a special guest who's going to help us talk about that topic. So Kevin, you want to introduce our guest? Yeah. So our guest today is Sarah Moberg. Uh, Sarah and I go way back. Uh, we worked together at General Mills. And then Sarah now works, uh, at, uh, and I'll let her uh, describe the, the, the um, you know, her, her journey, but um, at Second Harvest Heartland. Uh, which is an awesome organization, and I've had just minor uh, when I was in Minneapolis uh, working, uh, did did some minor uh, things with them, but just an amazing organization. But I don't want to steal uh, Sarah's thunder. So, Sarah, uh, welcome to, to to Three Squares, and uh, tell us a little bit about Second Harvest. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you all today and to share this conversation. Second Harvest Heartland is one of the largest food banks in the United States. And as a leader in the hunger relief network, we essentially source large quantities of food, bring it in, store it, and then distribute it in smaller quantities out to over a thousand food shelves, food pantries, other food uh, relief programs. Uh, and then in turn, that food goes into uh, the, the hands of neighbors who need just a little extra help uh, filling their table in this season. And is it, it, it's, it's not just Minneapolis, correct? It does, it branches across a lot of different states. Is that correct? Or tell me, you tell me. Sure, that's right. So Feeding America is the nationwide network right. of food banks. Second Harvest Heartland is one of those 200 member food banks. And our specific service area does reach across most of central Minnesota and then into Western Wisconsin. And based on our size and capabilities, we're also able to help source uh, food in, in those large pallet quantities and create mm -hmm. mixed trucks that go out all across the Midwest to smaller food banks who just need that little extra help in, in the sourcing area. So mentioning that sourcing, uh, I, I can't imagine the complexity of it. You've got a very vast network from grocers to farms to food service providers. Help us understand how those partnerships have evolved to meet the scale and what else is needed? How do you see them evolving going forward? Yeah, well, when we think about hunger relief, it is really an end-to-end -end system of partnerships. And so we have uh, growers that play a big role uh, and, and it, I can give you an example of how we uh, actually, about 25% of our uh, food sources come in from agricultural surpluses or mm. maybe secondary mm. markets. And so we work with growers to uh, take that secondary produce. So think about maybe a tomato that's just a little bit too ripe to make it through an entire supply chain or an onion that's too small, a potato that's misshaped or too big, all of those uh produce items that a typical retailer um, would not want to put on their shelf, but they are still perfectly healthy, nutritious, uh, edible um, pieces of produce. And so we work with growers to capture uh, those, those foods and transport them here to Second Harvest Heartland, or in some cases directly to food shelves where they can get out into and onto a neighbor's table. 
what I love about that particular supply chain is that in some cases we can go from farm to table in under a week. So it's oh, an wow. incredible advantage over what so many um, retailers are working with in a in an end to end supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, cool. You know, I'm wondering, Sarah. I mean, obviously we've been living through an inflationary period, and food security um, is is become an even bigger issue. So, I, I mean, how are you adapting to to meet that demand? And then, um, I'm curious what kind of trends you're seeing in terms of the people that. Uh, you know, we've all heard stories, different things coming out of COVID, but what does that look like today in terms of the trends you're seeing people um, coming in and asking for help? Yeah, sure. I, you know, affordability is tough right now. Uh, you know, hunger is is real. It's, it's in our communities. It does not discriminate. And, uh, you know, from a, um, I think there's a statistic that over, you know, 50% of uh, Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And so what that can look like is one unforeseen medical expense, maybe a flat tire, uh, a job loss or a reduction in um, working hours. And all of a sudden uh, people or a family will find themselves in need of just a little bit of extra help. And that is really what the Hunger Relief Network is here to provide. And so, um, you know, what we see is, is certainly demand and use of hunger uh, systems going up. Uh, I think there's a statistic in Minnesota that uh, says in 20 in the last year, we had about seven and a half million visits to food shelves. And mm. that was up two million visits from the year before. So, yeah, one of the dynamics is, as you think about all the different elements of a budget, food tends to be flexible and elastic. And so, it you know, you will find uh, families and individuals who are having a tough time maybe skipping a meal, maybe cutting back on, on the quantity or the variety or the nutritional value. And so, um, you know, that is, that is a lot of the trend that we're seeing and what we are so focused as, a, as an end-to-end -end network at trying to provide the right foods at the right times in the right places. So that well, brings Sarah, up a really you... interesting, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Susan. Oh, sorry, just the researcher in me. When you say 2 million more visits, do you have any idea, is that 2 million more different households or is it households just needing more the is their frequency increasing or maybe it's all of the above it is it, it, so it's a little bit of both mm -hmm. um and it is it is hard to necessarily track specifically um it's, you know oftentimes it is a zip code that people are providing and so um, that repeat use is difficult to, to necessarily track quantitatively. But what I would say qualitatively, what our partners are seeing and telling us is, yes, some people are absolutely coming and needing the assistance multiple times in a week or a month. And then other times uh, they will find people in line or using a food shelf and they're first time visitors. And they just happen to, you know, stumble mm -hmm. into that job loss or that medical bill that wasn't expected. Interesting. Thank you for that. Sorry, Charlie, interrupt. No, 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 no. This, this is. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. I know the work is is phenomenally important, but it also, I can't imagine the logistical challenge that you're that you face with this in terms of how do you use data, feedback, um, other creative methods to identify hot spots where the food goes, how you, I mean, 2 million more in a year is significant. So how do you juggle all of that? And how do you understand where the food needs to go, when it's going to be there? All of that logistical management has to be a significant part of what happens. Yeah. So there's a couple of ways to take that question. Uh, and, and the first is logistically, when you have the food, how does it get out to its, its final destination? And when you, we are working with over a thousand uh, partners, uh, food shelves and food pantries, uh, we are using a, a routing system similar to what you would find it, at the manufacturer, the retailer level, where we are routing um, you know, 30 to 40 trucks on any given day, and they're making multiple stops. And we're working to fill those tr trucks with as many you know, pounds per load as we possibly can. Um, but the other part to this question that I think is really interesting is that the sophistication of hunger relief is increasing every day mm -hmm. um, from a data perspective. And so we have made a significant investment in a data and analytics team. 
And with that team, what we've been able to do is to leverage uh, GIS mapping skills or you know publicly available databases and overlaid them versus the geography that exists across Minnesota so that we can actually look at where are the highest number of, you know, where's the population density and the highest amount of food insecurity. And then we can look at, are there retailers close by or are they sitting in a food desert? Um, where might we have food shelves and food pantries? What are their hours? What are their days? And so really looking at the accessibility of food in these um, hotspot areas. And when we then identify areas that are underserved, have the greatest need, we actually use a, uh, a convening approach. And so we are um, working with those communities and it is the neighbors in the community, other nonprofits in the community, partners or food shelves that may exist in the community and sharing that data and trying to co-create a, a plan mm -hmm and some next steps or some interventions that will help increase um, the food accessibility and move more people in that community towards food security. So it's a really great, uh, a great effort. Um, and it looks very different than the, what people historically think when they think about the food banking network as just moving pounds. It is so much more than that right now. That's fascinating. Um, and I love the idea of co-creating. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of, of developing community cultural support for the effort and what role that plays in your ability to be successful? Sure. I mean, when we talk about co-creating, part of that is getting in and, and listening. It is understanding the community and the neighbors who are in it. It is um, believing that everyone should have a meal that's right for them and really being uh, um, sensitive and reflective of what type of food would help make that possible. And so when we listen and we hear, then we are working to find the sources. And so one of the programs that we've um, invested significantly in over the last few years has been um, emerging farmers. And so mm. oftentimes uh, supporting emerging farmers and paying full market price for their product has allowed us to increase the numbers, the varieties of culturally um, connected foods and produce that we are able to offer. So think about varieties of um, peppers, for example, uh, and um, different lettuces, different greens. Um, all of those can really uh, be super helpful depending on the, the neighbors or the community needs. That's amazing. What about kale? <laughs> yes. Charlie loves kale. Okay, never mind. Charlie yeah. has a thing I, against kale. Yeah, I don't know I, what I, it is. I do. It's my deep... bias against kale. It's just deep he, rooted. He doesn't know how to massage his kale. It should be, we're That's not, right. Yeah, we're not. We're not going to. We're not That's going there. We're not going to massage vegetables. We're just going to cook <laughs> them and eat them. So, um, Sarah. So I was looking around your website, and one of the things I saw on your website, and it's pretty prominent, is you have a moonshot goal coming. Uh, you you, you want to cut hunger. I hope I'm saying this right. Cut hunger in Minnesota in half by 2030. So that's incredibly ambitious, uh, especially after the numbers you just gave about the visits increasing and all that kind of stuff. So I'm curious where that came from. Like, how are you thinking you're going to get there? How, you know, what's the, you know, what's the plan, so to speak? Because I think that's, I, I love a moonshot goal. I love seeing that kind of stuff. And I'm just curious of like how that, you know, what's your road roadmap forward? Yeah. Uh, all great questions. And I think when you think about uh, a moonshot goal. I mean, it is that. It is visionary. It is intended to be bold. Yeah. And we know that we can't do it alone. It is intended to be a community uh, goal. And, um, and when you think about cutting hunger in half for all of Minnesota by 2030, um, part of the reflection of that is like what we're doing, the status quo isn't working. Mm -hmm. And so we have to own that. And we have to own that um, we believe in a, a better future. Uh, we believe that if we just keep doing the same thing, that it's not sustainable, it's not meeting the needs. And so collectively, we want to work alongside the community and with other partners and with other nonprofits, even uh, nonprofits outside of the hunger relief sector, mm -hmm. um, to, to look at what are those uh, coalitions that we should be building, what are the initiatives and actions to move uh, the the community out of where we're at today. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so you talked about, you know, what is the plan? I, I think about it in three phases, three pillars. And it's around reducing, preventing, and then tracking. And so reduce, we've talked a lot about how do we just get food to where it's needed? How are we being most efficient with the resources that we that we have uh, and with the surpluses of food that are you know out there today? Uh, when you think about prevent, that is really around what are the new partnerships and the new um, and policies that we want to be advocating for that will work in support of um, and take pressure off of the hunger relief network as it exists today. And then tracking, it is about um, being able to measure so that we can do more of what works and less of what doesn't and quickly pivot. It's that learning mindset that we're really trying to bring into hunger relief. Makes sense. So in terms of, of making this happen, there's obviously a lot of moving parts. You've just, you've just kind of, you've outlined three. Um, so I, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm wondering is, um, you talked a lot about, you know, coalitions with other, uh, organizations in the community, even outside of food, which I think is really important, particularly like to meet constituents where they're, where they are. The other P and that can be challenging in and of itself, I'd love to hear more about that. This is a convoluted question, but the other piece of it is, is, um, you know, funding and, and charitable giving is really challenging right now. So I'm just curious, um, what are our different ways that maybe you're pivoting, whether it's through more coalition community involvement or other ways in terms of like the funding of, of making this happen that you're there seeing. Was, mm-hmm. One of the, one of the trends that we are also trying to think through is what does multi-year funding or multi-year commitments, um, what would they look like in support of this moonshot? Because when you think about really needing to move a system, it is so hard to do that without making multi-year commitments. And what we have found in creating uh, this vision is that industry partners are engaging. Uh, We've got other nonprofits, they're engaging. And so Mm -hmm. You know, I'll give you an example going back to the um, the emerging farmers. You know, when we are able to make a three year commitment to seeds and to you know uh, the the purchase, the buy after that harvest period, then all of a sudden those emerging farmers can negotiate better land leases. They can think about crop rotation. And so um, again, that is a small example, but it's an important one because it starts to give you an early indication of the the, the trend and how we're working to approach donations in a different way than we've done in the past. Hmm. This name, you know, Charlie, it's uh, making me think of the ranchers. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. I think the way that, that the comprehensive nature uh, that you're, that you're approaching this challenge is really impressive. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, a lot of the people that listen to us here uh, and there are people listening to our podcast, I think uh, are, in the both in agriculture but also in manufacturing food service and things like that what do you um you know if you know when you're talking to them what is needed from from all of those folks i mean from your sense like how can they help because i think you know especially as charlie mentioned at the top of the of the podcast you know about this is the time of giving this is the time of thinking about those type of things and about the community how what what do you um need you know from 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 folks like that Sure. I mean, certainly financial contributions are always welcome across hunger relief. Uh, but when you talk about the growers and manufacturers, I, I mean, the, and and the United States is a great agricultural and with brilliant source and brilliant manufacturers. And so having the awareness that hunger relief is out there, that we have a unique supply chain and a supply chain, quite frankly, that could be quite synergistic. Mm-hmm. Um, we can move food, we can rework food, we can repack food, we can get food out uh, that, you know, maybe if, again, all it takes is one blip in a supply chain, and all of a sudden your inventory levels are off. And we are an amazing outlet, and an efficient outlet, and an outlet that can take um, product that is still safe, and nutritionally perfect, um, but but not, um, not maybe up to a retailer's standards. And so again, that's it's we become a, a great option. So what we need from uh, manufacturers is that awareness, 
And then the willingness to pick up the phone, be top of mind that we are, we want to work together. We want to collaborate. Uh, we had an interesting example over the last year, our protein has actually increased uh, 20% and protein mm. is highly sought after. Mm. And it was a, um, a producer in California, a manufacturer in California, where some regulatory uh, um uh, reg, uh, regulatory issues on the export side mm. uh, changed, which impacted their ability and their inventory levels and their planning such that they were able to send so much excess product, um, in this case, it was chicken, uh, to a centralized food bank who then was able to repack it and distribute it all over the um, all over the country. Wow. And yeah, so I mean, again, those, yeah. these collaborations are out there. They are waiting to happen. We just need awareness and partnership. I love that. I love the idea of thinking of your organization and the and the larger organization as being so synergistic with manufacturing and food service and agriculture and that it shouldn't go to waste. It should be a way because I, I know that a lot of these folks, I mean, all of us know they're not looking to waste. They right. want to use it. So it's right. like, how do I use it in the most appropriate way possible? And I think that's great. Sarah, yeah, this has have, been, I mean, you have, on, I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. No, no, I'm just sitting here going, you have, I don't want to say unlimited inputs, but it's just this conversation is making me realize just how much of it is, is unlocking it and logistics. And I, that's fascinating. Um, and that you have data people doing this proactively to find the deserts. I mean, that is... Mm -hmm. That's unbelievable. It's very inspiring. Yeah, impressive work and, and much more comprehensive, I think, than, mm -hmm. than many know, including myself. So I appreciate you sharing that. We are now going to turn our attention for something else for which we are grateful, and that is the quiz. Every month, Kevin comes up with these unbelievably interesting and complex questions. We have no idea how much time he spends, but we're grateful for every moment. So, Kevin, we're going to turn it over to you to uh, stump the chumps. Awesome. All right. Well, and Sarah, you're you're more than welcome to either watch them both struggle or join. Uh, it's up to you. Please join uh, us in the struggle. Please join us in the struggle. <laughs> this month, it is canned goods because oh. I thought, okay, there's so much. Even though Thanksgiving, you think of like being very fresh, you know, you think of the turkey, you think of all that. There's a lot of canned goods that are used. And also, I was thinking of the topic of like, you know, uh, helping with hunger. And we oftentimes think of canned goods, you know, as yep. being something that we can donate. So I thought that'd be really great. Uh, so it's all about canned goods. So the first question, Gail Borden, uh, founder of the Borden Dairy and inventor of condensed milk is also famous for all of the following except one. So which of the following is not true about Gail Borden? One. Is Gail a man or a woman? Or it's, a, it's a man. Yeah, it's okay. a man. Yeah. Uh, one, he was the original surveyor for the land that today is Galveston, Texas. B. He invented a meat biscuit that could be stored indefinitely and was used in several Arctic expeditions. C, he is related to the infamous axe killer Lizzie Borden. Or D, his original name for condensed milk was abbreviated milk. Galveston is too obvious. Galveston is too obvious. So it can't be Galveston. Okay. Lizzie Borden. Okay. Susan's locking in Lizzie Borden. I was going to go, go the same. I'm okay. going to go abbreviated milk. Charlie is correct. It is. It, he didn't. He originally called it condensed milk. All the rest are true. He is very famous in Texas for being a surveyor. He started one of the state's first newspapers with his brother, and he was appointed the Republic of Texas Collector of Customs by Sam Houston. So hmm. very famous in Texas. Uh, and yes, he actually is, I believe, a cousin of the infamous Lizzie Borden. So. All right, Charlie is up. Uh, Carnation Farms, speaking of, of milk, Carnation Farms is a site in the state of Washington where the original cows were kept whose milk went into Carnation Evaporated Milk. Carnation Farms has- Did a they evaporate the cows or did they, they evaporate the cows? The it was cows, very, okay. the milk, I don't want to talk about Charlie. it. Just the milk, okay, just the milk, got it. Carnation Farms. Farms, yeah, they're very small. Carnation <laughs> Farms has another connection to the food industry. What is it? So Carnation, is it A, Carnation Farms is now the site of the world's largest whole food store? Is it B, Carnation Farms is now part of the Martinez potato farm and exclusively grows potatoes from McDonald's french fries? 
Is it C, Carnation Farms was the original site of the -the hole-in-the-wall camp founded by Paul Newman and sponsored by Newman's Own Foods, where seriously ill kids could go to camp? Or is it D, Carnation Farms is still a dairy farm owned by Tillamook and produces the company's famous cheese and ice cream? And where is it located again? It's in Washington State. Washington State. Go on, Tillamook. Tillamook. Okay. Susan, I'm going to go hole in the wall. Hole in the wall. Charlie's going with hole in the wall. Sarah? I was going to go Tillamook as well. Okay. Charlie is correct again. Oh, man. In 2008, Carnation yeah. Farms became Camp Cory, which is part of the hole in the wall camp founded by Paul Newman. But then in 2016, oh. Camp Cory moved from Carnation Farm to a property in Skagit County. So, but it was one of the original hole in the wall camps for kids. So, I knew it wasn't potatoes because I know who the exclusive supplier of potatoes is. There actually is, for a time, the Martinez family was a grower of of McDonald's French fries potatoes. Ah. Yeah. But okay. yeah, I think I feel like I should just pack up and go home. <laughs> <laughs> There's still time yeah, to catch up. That was this number two. Darts at the wall, you baby. Know, darts at the wall. We still have okay. a potato tracker called Potato Track. Mm, one of my favorite po- MPD products. Potato called what? Track. Called what? Potato what? Potato Track. Potato We're very track? good at naming, branding. Yeah, yeah Potato Track. Did, was Mr. Potato Head on that, on that group or not? Do we know? No, we didn't do anything with Mr. Potato Head. All no. right. Okay. Number three, Campbell Soup. Most iconic mascot is the Campbell's Kids. Cherubic children shown playing and eating soup. Invented in 1905 by That'll be better than the babies in the coffee bean. Or in the yeah, I was going to say, the cocoa, baby the cocoa in the coffee bean from yeah, last month. Yeah, bean, cocoa bean no. is bad. Uh, yeah. Invented in 1905 by illustrator Grace Brayton for part of a streetcar advertising campaign. Hmm. They've been changed with the times ever since. Which of the following has a Campbell's kid never represented? They have represented many things. They've dressed up them up as many things. Which of the following have they never represented? Is it A, a flapper, B, George Washington, C, a goth, or D, a hip-hop fan? Ah. <laughs> you see how these crack me up every time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go goth as well. I just cannot see those kids as goth. <laughs> but, but it's a pretty interesting image. <laughs> if you get that one stuck, I'm going to have nightmares about this. I'm gonna, those little kids are going to be dressed in goth and tormenting me over the weekend. So Susan, you said, you said, you said, you said, Charlie, you said, I did double, I'm, yeah, I'm going yeah. golf. I'm going golf. What too. are you saying, Sarah? Sarah? Well, now I'm a little nervous. I was going to go with Charlie, but now that you agree, I, I'll go golf. <laughs> okay. It is true. It is golf. That was probably too yeah. easy. But yeah. yes, the golf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But Kevin, I mean, slipping. you should, you should, I know. I, I, I totally was going to change it, but I thought, no, it's just it's okay. too much we of needed, a, a we mental needed a, image. We needed we're, a where's the gimme? We're still tormented by the baby in the cocoa bean. Okay. Still Charlie, Charlie's up. What is the oldest still edible canned food ever discovered? Was it A, a can of peaches from 1895 sealed in a time capsule in rural Kansas? Was it B, a can of tomatoes from a steamboat wreck from 1865 in Omaha, Nebraska? Was it C, a can of a tin of oysters in an abandoned prospector's lean-to in San Francisco from the gold rush of 1849? Or was it D, a can of corned beef in a, a railway tunnel in London, circa 1870? I'm going tomatoes. Can of tomatoes. For oysters. Lock. Oysters. Mm-hmm. Was going to go oysters, too. Okay. Charlie is correct again. Charlie is on We're the on ball fire today. today. So I just thought with a, with a, what I know about canning tomatoes is the, the pH. Right, oh, it, it doesn't actually have anything to do with that because the really? steamboat wreck actually had oh, tomatoes. It was cold. It, no, it was just there was a bunch of stuff. There was um, so it was a steamboat uh, out of uh, Montana, uh, Fort Benton, Montana. That was or it was destined. Excuse me, it was it was it was destined for uh, the Fort Benton, Montana, down the Missouri River. It got caught and it sunk into the river, and it was a combination of stuff. Uh, it, it actually, you know, it, it was canned uh, peaches. Oysters, plum tomatoes, honey, and then mixed vegetables. So all of them were considered after no one ate them. They did lab studies. They were all edible after uh, 109 years. We know they were edible. They but- tested them. They said they wouldn't have been tasty, but they would have been. They would have been edible. <laughs> oh, all right. Wow. Last yeah. 109 years. That's pretty that's good. Pretty good. That's pretty good shelf life. Yeah. Pretty good. Canned canned food is is amazing like that. So okay, yeah. last question. Uh, in 1996, what caused Chef Boyardee to become the only brand to ever request to be removed from an episode of Seinfeld? 
It's the only brand ever to be uh, to request to have their name pulled from a sign. Because oh, sorry. Okay, you already know the answer. Okay, I'm gonna. You can. Okay. I, we'll see if I do. I don't know. Okay, A in the episode The Rye, Kramer operates a handsome cab and feeds the horses Chef Boyardee, causing them to have frequent and foul <laughs> flatulence. <laughs> Was it B in the episode, the yada yada, Elaine finds out her grandmother actually dated Chef Boyardee and she might be an illegitimate heir to the canned pasta fortune. Oh my God. Was it C in the episode, the soulmate, Jerry thinks he finds a toenail in his can of Chef Boyardee. Was it D in the episode, the package, George loses his new girlfriend because he serves her Chef Boyardee on their first date. I'm going to recuse horses. myself. I'm going horses. Well, no, don't recuse you, yourself. You never recuse. Jump in. You, you, I mean, I know the answer. Well, that's fine. well, then that's Go perfect. Be last. Be last wanna, because I don't want right. to give Charlie a leg up. No, okay. I, you don't. I said horses. So Charlie said horses. Sarah, what do you, Sarah? I was gonna go with toenail. Toenail. See, it's Susan, horses. what's you're not influencing anyone now. What do you? What do you? What's your horses? Toe? Horses. Yeah, you are correct. Yeah. It is horses. They the the writers changed the name to Beefer uh, Reno after uh, <laughs> after uh, Chef Boyard complained, which you know undoubtedly it, so. I mean, the toenail yeah. would have been worse, but it was yes. gross. Yes. It was yeah. gross. My yes. husband is going to be so excited that you worked a Seinfeld, and this is one of his favorite <laughs> ones besides the um, the one where Constanza said he was an architect and he wasn't. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. everybody wants to be yeah. an architect. My husband's an architect, Sarah. That's true. Haven't, haven't watched. They it. think it's haven't way sexier it. than it really is in reality, but not that. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. Isn't. Yeah, All the right. Walking clo walk closet joke fell kind of flat, but that's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it's okay. We, we won't tell it again. Okay. Charlie, you did it. Look at that. I got lucky. Amazing. I got lucky. These were just Amazing. stamps in the dark, but uh, yeah. Well, Charlie, I appreciate did that. you have it's a good. Costco hot dog this morning or something? What's, I did. What's... I did not. I did not. <laughs> but I might now. I might. I'm feeling, I'm feeling lucky. I'll get a Costco hot dog and buy a lottery ticket. Who knows what could happen? So. All right, that wraps it up for our November edition of Three Squares. Thank you so much for joining us. We are always grateful for your presence. We hope you enjoy the show. Join us again in December. We will be back again one month from now. In the meantime, if you'd like to reach out to us, you can do so by contacting us via email at threesquaresmail at gmail.com. That's the numeral and spell out squaresmail at gmail.com. Look forward to hearing from you. If not, we will catch you next month. Susan, Kevin, Sarah, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your month. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks.